here, start recording. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Good morning, everyone. Jazakum al-Khair for tuning in. Uh, we are very delighted today to have very special guest today. Uh, just quick introduction. Um, as we all uh, have a problem in our local community and many Muslim communities in the US, that most of our Islamic schools uh, end up at the elementary level. So whenever our kids reach the middle school or high school, we start struggling where to uh, pursue their education. And the only available option most of the time will be just to go back to the public schools. And this is a very critical time for kids in their early puberty, when all the crazy hormones kick in and all the challenges of drugs, bullying, and uh, the impact of uh, friends and uh, colleagues may impact them. And no matter how strong and deep the roots and the foundation you, you have built in the elementary school, this may all be shaken and exposed to fitna and challenges during uh, the middle and high school. So we faced that last year uh, when my daughter Rawan was in, uh, going to the eighth grade. And alhamdulillah, we came across uh, Legacy, uh, uh, an international online high school, which is the first, uh, as we can tell, uh, to um, establish an Islamic online homeschool for high schoolers. So alhamdulillah, they are in the first year now, and Rawan, my daughter, is uh, already there uh, since past August. And alhamdulillah, we, we've been experiencing the homeschooling for the first time, and um, we learned a lot of experience, and Rawan became our like uh, Zoom IT help desk. She is our reference in all the challenges that we face in, in the Zoom meetings and, and the homeschool scheduling. Uh, we plan to share this experience with our community back in March, and this is very... Uh, a special moments by the time that Brother Zahir was planning to drive from Oklahoma to our community to deliver the khutbas and the program at uh, Friday night. This when uh, Colombia decided to lock down and the masjid was closed. And this was the first Jum'ah that was canceled. I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, ease this uh, pandemic and end this uh, crisis. And we will be blessed to have him again in our community, inshallah. So, uh, all of a sudden, with, after COVID-19, we all found, found ourselves to be uh, home teachers besides being parents and besides working from home. So that's brought a lot of uh, challenges and a lot of stress, how to navigate our new normal, how to handle our kids who've been facing homeschooling for the first time, how we handle our schedules with all these challenges. So I'm delighted now to have our expert in the field of homeschooling, and education and Islamic education. Brother Zahir Arusto has a master's degree in education and he is the head of the Legacy International Online High School. Uh, he will tell us more about this school and the program and the unique perspective in Islamic education that the school is uh, handling. And uh, also um, helped with him by Dr. Seema Imam. Professor Imam is uh, a professor in education at the National Lewis University, and she is the chair of the Islamic School League of America, ISLA. And we are proud that the Islamic uh, School of Central Mi of Columbia, Missouri, uh, in our community, is part of this. Uh, uh, he will tell us more about this school and large body uh, that uh, coordinates um, the Islamic schools across the U.S. Uh, so I'm so delighted. With no further ado, uh, please go ahead. I think uh, Brother Zahir posted a survey in the chat box. Um, the chat is private, so only host and the co-host can see the discussion. Uh, I think I have issue before in terms of copying uh, whatever messages in the in the chat box. So if you guys have any problem with copying the links, just type in. I will try to change the settings so I will make it uh, able to copy. Uh, Dr. Imam and brothers are here. Welcome and please go ahead. Thank you so much. Dr. Muhannad, would I be able to have the sharing uh, rights? You should because you are a co-host. Mm -hmm. Is there any issues with sharing? Uh, let me see if it's going to allow me to. Yep. We are seeing your screen. You see my screen? Okay. 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. We'll begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa taala. We'll just uh, we always start uh, every opportunity to learn with this dua. اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا ونفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما نافعا يا كريم آمين. جزاكم الله خيرا to you Dr. Mohanad and your community for uh, inviting us for this opportunity and also inviting us uh, before the COVID uh, uh, test uh, came upon us. Uh, we're so delighted to be here. Um, uh, again, I'm, I'm uh, Dr. Mohammed mentioned. I'm, you know, I'm honored to be here uh, representing Legacy International Online High School. But I'm also uh, a homeschooling parent. I have uh, alhamdulillah four children, and uh, my children have actually been through uh, the journey of every type of schooling possible. Uh, as an educator, uh, we, I had my children in in uh, every school environment, uh, from public school to private school to Islamic school to homeschool to different versions of homeschool. And, and Dr. Seema, who, who is uh, my mentor, mashallah, over here, and has been a guiding force for us uh, uh, in, in, with this new project, alhamdulillah, uh, has eight children, mashallah. And, uh, and how many children have you homeschooled, Dr. Seema? Just the last one, the youngest one. Okay, alhamdulillah. There are seven children. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> So uh, we have some experience, alhamdulillah, to share with you about uh, quote-unquote homeschooling. And Dr. Mohanad asked us to talk a little bit about uh, maybe some tips related to uh, homeschooling now during COVID. And then we can also talk a little bit about what uh, homeschooling might look like uh, beyond COVID. So to, to help us uh, with the, to guide our conversation and inform our conversation, we thought it would be useful if we had an opportunity to have you all fill out that short little survey. It's just three questions in the chat. And that uh, that survey basically just, will ask us to, um, we'll ask you uh, just a few questions about what you're looking to get answered here. It also give us an idea about the age ranges of your children uh, because of uh, some of the, the advice we might give will, you know, can be, can be uh, contextualized based on the uh, age ranges of your children. So, so, can you, can you uh, email me the link for the survey? Sure. I will put it like on the screen, it's easier. The, there's an ability to copy from the chat box. Okay, I'm so sorry. So that's fine. You can keep talking and then uh, maybe when you handle the slide to the Persima, I can handle this on the way. Sure, sounds good. So I can introduce myself while you're doing that. That would be great, yes. I'm, I'm Sima Imam. I'm a, pro a professor of education, elementary, uh, middle grades, and special education, and have a doctorate in curriculum and Islamic education. And as brother said, I have uh, raised a, a family, a house full of kids, and alhamdulillah, I homeschooled the, the last one right after 9-11 all the way through high school, alhamdulillah. Uh, lots of fun experiences I had along the way was being a principal of an Islamic school, and the last 23, four years I've been a professor. So uh, I started in Chicago Public Schools where I spent about 16 years so I've had that big inner city class of students, uh, both focused and non-focused. So lots of experiences uh, relate to what we're talking about today and how we work with our children uh, at home, regardless of where they go to school. I'm not sure if uh, you're ready to share the slides, but sure. Mm -hmm. I know you're multitasking and that's so often what we do. <clears throat> Thank you so much for everyone for your patience for trying to handle multiple things at, at once. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Seema, do you see the screen? I do. All right. Okay. Do you want me to begin with this one? <clears throat> so as we think about what we're thinking in terms of homeschooling, we were hoping to get a little bit of background from you in the survey. 
uh, all of us, and we think about our goals, uh, what our goals might be, we thought, you know, you've probably got some academic goals, some goals around spirituality, uh, goals around, um, we had a list here, physical education of your children, your family goals, your um, um, life skills, and finally, what unique learning needs your children might have. So as we think about those goals, we're gonna walk through these individually and inshallah, we're gonna to touch on some ideas that we have and, and ways for you uh, as parents uh, making the tremendous decisions that you make. Um, we never underestimate you know, the, the role that parents play. Whether you're a teacher in school or a principal in school, when you look at parents, you realize that parents have a choice. And when they make a choice, um, Did Dr. Seema freeze? Yeah, we cannot hear her. Okay, I think there must be connection. Okay, I'll mute her and then unmute. Well, that's here you can take over, inshallah. Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, she'll be back in just a little bit. Zakim Lachain for your patience, inshallah. So, yeah, we were just talking a little bit about the last uh, item that, of course, that when we plan uh, homeschooling our children, uh, even during this COVID time, we have to really think about the big picture. What are the overall goals? Um, in, the, in the initial phase, everyone's thinking, how can I just keep my kids busy? <laughs> but the idea, uh, if we want to I mean, be more intentional about it, it's going to be more productive and, and, and yield better results. So these are some of the areas that we thought would be important to touch upon. Uh, but the most important thing at the end is, you know, uh, really, we have to understand our children and, and their unique learning needs. So we can start with um, uh, some of the no-brainers, which probably, I, you know, all of you have uh, thought about because it's already been a couple of weeks that, has it been like three weeks for you all in, in uh, Missouri? that you all have been on lockdown or how long has it been since school? I think almost a month now. It's been a month, okay. Yeah. So uh, I, I won't spend too much time on this because I'm sure that you have it, but just in case you don't, I, I wanna make sure that we talk about uh, workstation and how important it is to have an area, designated area to work. Um, you know, we ha I've seen so many, uh, heard stories of so many uh, children who are stressed out because they are, uh, you know, oftentimes in, in an area where there's so much happening uh, with other kids in the house and it's noisy and, um, in, in, and so we want to make sure that there is a quiet distraction free location in which students can work. In. And there are a couple ways to achieve that, but I, I will uh, uh, add to that, that there, there should be a desk or some kind of table that they're sitting at, uh, preferably having natural lighting. Uh, I try to keep things near windows uh, so that light can come in if possible. Uh, the other important piece about this, if our kids are going to be sitting and working um, at, uh, for some time, we want to make sure that the, the setup is, is appropriate. Uh, and, and most many of you as physicians know, of course, the importance of having the good posture. And, you know, when the kids are sitting for a long time and if they're looking down at the screen and if, they're, if their hands are, are too, uh, too high, these can result in all kinds of different uh, stresses and issues with their, their body. Um, so we want, to, we want to kind of give them a very comfortable uh, uh, place to sit. And sometimes those things we don't think about that much, but the idea is that the screen should be at a place where it's it, it, the camera, if they're gonna be using camera or if they're using a screen, it should be aligned kind of with their face, you know, and their hands should be uh, at a keyboard that is low enough. It's not that they're raised, it's, it's pretty much very comfortable to where their lap would be if they were sitting. Uh, some some people and, and have have uh, uh, utilized uh, a new technique, which is the standing desk. I'm not sure if you've heard about the standing desk, but uh, that's something that I use personally uh, because I am online quite a bit throughout the day. So I actually have set up uh, just a, you know I didn't go out and get any special desk. I just took a table and then I create I, I situated some boxes in a way that would make the screen align with my forehead in my eyes. And then I have a, a, an attached laptop, which is at a lower level. And this 
allows me to stand for uh, long periods of time. I can exercise. I never have to worry about you know circulation issues in my my legs. So this is something to think about uh, if that's if that's doable. And the last thing, of course, that's important when, when you're setting up the workstation, depending on the age of the children, of course, is related to supervision and how you can be uh, available to supervise and to support your child uh, at that workstation. And basically, I guess if you all have questions, I don't know if you can, uh, can they put their questions in the chat as they come along? Yeah. Or? Okay. Yeah. All right. Dr. Seema, we'll take on the next slide, shall we? Yes. <clears throat> so, you know, I was just giving the goals and then I got kicked off. So I'm back. Alhamdulillah. And I was talking about goals related to all the areas. Now we're hitting the areas. We must have a schedule. We absolutely must find a way that we can, you know, and, and Islam certainly delivers this to us in a pristine package that we have the adhan and the prayer and, you know, five daily prayers. And we know exactly uh, when we're going to pray and sunrise and sunset and, you know, the middle of the day. And these things are really important. And it becomes part of our nature when we practice this in a family setting. And, you know, the second one is chores and life skills. To have students know that, you know, even if it's as small as removing their breakfast, you know, um, plates from the table or dinner plates from the table. Besides that, maybe, you know, we're going to go into a slide related to this later, but, um, and I'm forgetting the exact PDF uh, that Brother Zahir put here, but Zahir put, um, what is it? Yes, yes, uh, play, yes. downtime, and family yes. time. Yes, so playing, downtime, and family time. These ideas here are for you to really consider. As educators in classrooms, you know, we take brain breaks for our children. And so we would want you in your home setting to take a brain break and have a chance for some downtime, some family time within the day. When I was homeschooling my son, I, we used to agree at the beginning of the year, what time will we be sure to get up? Of course, it was a little after Fajr. We'd pray Fajr and sleep a bit. And then we'd start our school. So we had an agreement. And then we would both be paying attention to each other so that we planned, you know, how we were going to do it, how much work we would do independently, how much work students should accomplish on their own, and how much study time might be important. Well, about the time he was in third grade, he said, you know, I'm missing something. And I said, oh, what? You can't possibly be missing something. I planned such a good plan. And he said, no, I'm missing gym. I need to be enrolled in something or have a regular time. So see the extracurricular, you know, with your heart. Because children do need places where they can build in, you know, that time for their mind to be less academic. And so having a scheduled time for that worked really well. Um, even us going for a walk, we used to go to a little schoolhouse by a lake and that exercise and physical fun, uh, we went there and we, we made sure that uh, we did it like on a Wednesday. We used to speak about cabin fever. Little did I know that one day I myself would be in this coronavirus time where I'm actually in, in experiencing cabin fever like probably most people. So we can use our backyards, we can use our front porch, maybe you have a balcony, whatever it is. We need to schedule a time for fresh air. And that's really one of the things related to coronavirus as well. That sunshine and fresh air and certainly, you know, the whole Islamic spirit of who we are as Muslims uh, to observe nature and bring ourselves back to, you know, the creation and, and looking for things in nature, looking at spring right now. I think you can uh, see that the schedule is very important and uh, you'll figure out how you want to plan. There are things online and maybe we have some resources that we could send you as well. Mm -hmm. But it's really important to work from um, an agreement between you and children so that they know that you're also on a schedule. I think we've got... Uh... I do have a, a way to share the survey if people cannot oh. copy it from the uh, chat box. So I would just beg your attention to share my screen and ask people to scan this QR code by their phones. It will take them to the survey and they can go ahead and fill it while we're waiting. Uh, we'll give you like a few seconds. So again, just pull up, pull up your, your phone 
scan the barcode and it will take you to the survey. MashaAllah, Dr. Mohandad, you're busting out the QR codes. Yeah, I was just <laughs> I'm say very impressed. And I'm a Rwanda student, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, there is a question, I think. Let me just see what's going on. Waiting room. Okay. Admit them all. All right. Uh, I will stop sharing the screen and would allow you, Brother uh, Zahir, to keep going with the presentation. Sure. Okay. Go ahead. Perfect. So some uh, one of the sisters said that she can she was able to uh, click on the link. That's great. Very good. Okay. okay. Great. Okay, good. Right. Oh, I, we got our first one. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Be helpful, inshallah. I All think right, inshallah. Yeah, go to the next slide. Um, sure. This is the spirituality piece that's very important. Awesome. So obviously, uh, uh, there, there's uh, this this time is uh, extremely uh, uh, one of the great blessings we have, even though we have all been suffering from not being able to go to the masjid. Uh, we've been put in the position to, you know, turn our homes into, into masajid. And uh, one of the things that when we plan our homeschooling schedule, um, it would be uh, central, it would be vital and, and critical to make sure that spirituality is, uh, and the goals for our spiritual upbringing and the tarbiyah are going to be, you know, at the core of what we're doing uh, in our homes. So I'm sure that all of you have things you can share and we probably could have a shared list where we could talk about strategies we're using. These are just a couple of things that uh, are reminders for our, ourselves that we could do uh, as we try to, uh, to fulfill spiritual goals. Uh, one of them is involving our kids in, in, in all of that, right? So involving children in giving the adhan before prayer. Kids love to, to, to do things like that. And this is a great opportunity to praise them uh, teach them, uh, you know, and then the idea is, you know, 10 minutes before they're getting ready and that the, they're looking forward to the prayer so they can call that adhan in the house. And, in, you know, everyone's houses are different sizes and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, floors and all that. In Oklahoma, everything's just flat. I don't know how it is in Missouri, but uh, we have everything's just single story here. But uh, either way, the, sometimes the distance between rooms is, is, um, is uh, far. So we have uh, many different systems we've seen uh, families implement. Uh, we have seen families go from uh, where the adhan is called in a central area, maybe not even in the prayer area, but it's called like in the kitchen area is almost so that everyone can hear. We've seen uh, people that once the adhan is called, there's a messenger sent to rooms who goes and says, uh, prayer in five minutes, prayer in 10 minutes. And that's par part of the fun. You turn all of this into fun, right? The whole idea is that the the... The things that we uh, that sometimes kids might think as you know uh, uh, you know the, the parent is coming and saying it's time for prayer you got to stop playing video games now we're involving the kids in the process and they themselves are owning and, and empowered to be the messenger to get the reward of everybody coming to prayer on time as a jama. So having the kids running around and 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 uh, uh, facilitating you know the the message getting out. Uh, we've even seen families um, invest in a karaoke machine. Have you ever seen those? Those you can order them. It's a small little, uh, you know, uh, speaker. Some of them come with a lapel mic. Some come with this because uh, what is more exciting to a child than being able to get on a mic and say something, right? Yes. It's so much fun. So uh, kids sing the adhan on the mic and uh, and and even leading prayer on that and uh, reciting a surah or something. So uh, it's it's a it's a very small investment, but it's it, it the joy that it brings uh, to that process of of being involved in, in uh, calling the Adhan and, and reciting Quran and stuff, it, it's really uh, uh, wonderful. Uh, prayer and congregation, uh, obviously it may not be possible for every prayer, uh, but maybe on weekends, whenever it's possible, that would be, that would be the ideal. Uh, but at least, at least two prayers a day, uh, there should be a, a way to get in two prayers in Jama'a a day, uh, even for busy families uh, uh, to the best of their ability. Uh, in many houses, there is a designated location. So everyone knows that this is the spot where we, we have our salah. And that, that helps with so many things. And in, a lot of, in classrooms, even in a school year, you have designated spots and locations for things that give some reverence to the salah itself. 
So, uh, you know, everyone comes to that spot. Uh, the other parts are, are you know, all uh, different um, things that we can do to enrich the, that spiritual experience. Uh, everyone was always uh, complaining when we were really, really uh, not stuck uh, about not having enough family time and and not having that time to spend. And this is almost a blessing in, in, from Allah SWT in, in so many ways that we have an opportunity to actually sit and reflect with our children. You know, it's uh, the usual routine for all of us as humans is we, we pray and it's enough that they got the prayer in and they're on the run. But in this case, we can actually have an opportunity, maybe once a day, maybe it's Isha prayer that we sit and we stay on that musalla for a few minutes and we make dhikr together. And we start, we, we share an ayah or a student, one of the children shares an ayah. You know, maybe they're, they're in charge of that day of sharing something. Uh, where they can 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 uh, they can prompt the family to reflect on something. Uh, we have a lot of families do movie. They're talking about movie nights in their homes. You can also have an Islamic video or lecture uh, opportunity. And the last one is uh, I think Sheikh Omar Suleiman and some others have coined this term called Quran teen instead of quarantine. Uh, how can we turn the the Quran teen, quarantine time into quarantine and where we actually have a schedule for Quran goals? Uh, normally we make itikaf in the last 10 days of Ramadan but Allah has given us opportunity to to have this opportunity uh, to, to kind of uh, have this seclusion with Quran uh, throughout all this this lockdown so having an opportunity whether the family is sitting together and reading Quran whether the family is sitting together and reflecting on and they're just reading the translation together or whether there are actually memorization goals as a family we're all going to memorize one ayah just one ayah and we'll this this is that we're going to recite it together every week. And imagine a family memorizing one ayah of Quran, thinking about the meaning, and then trying to practice that. Uh, there can only be barakah from that, inshallah. Next slide, inshallah, for Dr. Sima. MashaAllah, that's a great list. And I want to open my uh, academic goals with the thought that what was just explained, really, um, and the totality of what we're talking about today is a family curriculum. When we think about a school having a curriculum and we find ourselves now in homeschooling or in quarantine, <laughs> quarantine and COVID-19 days, this is an era we'll never forget. But it's such an opportunity for Muslims to develop these things in their home and family. I know that I was on that speed train, many, many things to do, many, many places to go. And many of you may have found yourself in the same situation. So if we set our academic goals <clears throat> as being very important to us, we wanna be careful of a few things. And you'll find these in the guidelines that the states have sent out. Mm -hmm. States never dreamed they were going to do this, but they were quick to engage with people who understand online learning, you know, and could give us advice and help and tips um, that we wanna focus on the process. You know, and I invite you to, as parents, uh, share every book you read, read so kids see you read. But if you have a little extra time, read an article or a book about makerspace. Makerspace is an, a new thing and it's really uh, applicable to our home. If you find yourself telling your children to make a cake or make the pancakes and they have fractions, it's math. Integrating doing so that it's not just the, you know, the math paper, but it's infiltrating, you know, infusing, integrating everything together. So it's woven like a fancy carpet. It's woven, you know, like a tapestry. The love of learning in the academic goal is the first step. We show our kids, we avoid just telling them. We're firm, but kind. And yes, we want to get to quality quality, Hassan, you know, being a role model. We do need to take care of ourselves and we need our kids to take care of themselves in this, you know, having the break so that it's not a lot of screen time that's very engaging and challenging and can even result in a headache for students, particularly if they're not used to it or if they're too close to the screen. So these academic goals mean that you're planning for a healthy, academic learning environment uh, in the school setting. So if we think family curriculum and the ways of being as a family, well, two spouses came to the marriage, two spouses are raising the children. So you want to bring the good of both of your childhoods 
to, to your household. You've probably already done this because you're not new to having children, but as educators and academic, academic leaders in our home and homeschooling, we want to be good role models. And I think that, you know, reading a Quran is one, but reading of another book is another. Or reading the Quran in English might be necessary for some families. So it goes beyond good parenting. It goes beyond our own professional career because we know where we went to school and what we qualified ourselves for in our bachelor's and undergraduate, our master's, our doctorate, but we need a good mix. I would say here that in fact, it's a good idea to build in some good recognition, you know, um, recognition, whether it's a reward, something simple, uh, a privilege, you know, uh, setting those goals that we talked about earlier, <clears throat> and then focusing on what kind of academic success we want our students to have in this time means that they need to set the goal. So at the beginning of every week, if you can write out some goals with your students at the end of each day, children can visit the goal and parents can revisit the goal. And at the end of the week, we can honestly say to one another, and I did this in my homeschooling experience with my son, just like as if I were in a classroom, because I spent many, many years there in a classroom as well, that children need to know what they're learning and what they're gonna be able to do and whether or not they succeeded and reached their goals. So we need that visual schedule, some kind of what is it that we do day to day and what are we going to accomplish, that list of goals, and then did we, you know, and we gotta to start to check them off. and. It's okay to say, you know, Baba, Abu, Ami, Mama, whoever it is, I didn't reach my goal. And, and we don't become angry. We become uh, constructive. Oh, I have had a goal before that I didn't reach. What can we do to plan for not being in this position next week? And how can we build in success? So that will reduce the stress by itself is when they realize that even though we're very serious about the academic piece, but we're also aware that success is a lot of it in their hands. If we become, you know, um, like, um, you know, kind of control and battle, we may lose, particularly in this scenario when we're all in the same house a lot all day long. So I'm just encouraging you to integrate a lot of things into this academic goal setting, and particularly your child at the helm. I think we can go to the next slide, which is probably developing life skills. Zakalah here. Yes. So uh, Dr. Seema actually touched on some of this already, and we're just, uh, you know, uh, obviously everybody is, uh, is doing some of this, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. Uh, but we want to emphasize the the critical role um, that when we think of the homeschooling, we have an opportunity to teach so much more than uh, to to set up the learning for so much more than academic goals for school. And uh, and in the end, when we look at our own Islamic tradition, uh, we know that uh, that that armies were led by teenagers. Right? Imagine a 17-year-old you know, leading in an army and chosen of over older people to, to lead. What was it that helped those uh, people? Or we can say, oh, they were just Sahaba. They were Sahaba so that we can never be like that. But actually, if we look back and think, what was the process that, that the Prophet Sallallahu the best teacher, uh, what did he go through? What did he take these, these people through? Uh, how, how did he guide them so that by the time they were 17, they were ready to lead an army? Maybe not everyone is ready, but they were ready to do that. And that's because the mindset was very different back then. Uh, and I think it's shifted a lot over time. And we can all acknowledge that we, we find, uh, you know, uh, grown uh, adults uh, in college spending a lot more time on battle in, in a video game than they would ever in, in, in any other battlefield, right? <laughs> so the, the, the extension of adolescence and the extension of childhood into later years uh, has really been a big shift in, in, in uh uh, what we're seeing among quote unquote older kids. But I think that as Muslim parents, we, if we have the mindset that when they're young, from a young age, we can develop the skills that they need to become the next man of the house, the next woman of the house. Uh, you're, I'm training you to become the, the next person in charge. You're going to be my supporter. You're going to be the man of the house. I need you to learn all these, uh, these, these tasks. You're going to be so, you know, 
you're going to be a leader, you know? And so what does that mean? It starts with, I call it character building. <laughs> uh, met so many families that I, 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 and I'm being very honest that they've shared with me that, you know, and we asked them, how come when we're at school, sometimes in school, we see that the students aren't cleaning up after themselves. And they say, well, that's, that's our fault because at home, we want to, you know, we, we set the table up for our kids. They come and then they, they get the food, they eat, and then they run back and do their work. And, you know, we're just being, we want to just be supportive of them. And that's beautiful. Uh, and, and sometimes that may be okay. But the reality is uh, they're missing a really, really important opportunity to develop their character and develop life skills. And that is that the being part of the process of preparing food, serving food, cleaning up after the food is served is as if not more important than some of time, some of their lessons that they're learning in, in school. Uh, and and uh, we all know this as, 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 uh, as members of a family, how critical these other parts of life are to even sometimes the peace in the home. There's no dishes, <laughs> everything's a mess. That leads to a mess outside of the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> in our relationships. So if kids can start from a young age, and I, I mean, I remember with, uh, with my youngest children when they were five years old, now they might, they might mess some things up in the process, but that's all part of the, the, the joy of learning. So it can be a start with starting with loading the dishwasher to, you know, getting uh, to drying dishes, to putting soap on dishes, to just picking up your plate after you're done eating. Uh, these are little things, but they make a huge difference. It should, it should lead to a point where not only are they cleaning up after themselves, but now they're cleaning the table. Maybe the the dream they they pull the chair behind, uh, they pull the chair out for their parents to sit down, and then they they serve their parents for dinner. How about that? <laughs> right? That would be the instilling in them that that concept of of khidma in the family, and it starts from a young age. So the younger you start, uh, the the more it becomes a part of who they become. We are. We understand that we are an in, in, in interdependent family. It's not just me in my bedroom, in my TV, in my laptop, in my, my or it's I, was it I, iPad, <laughs> my pad and everything. No, it's we, we are a family and we, and, and, and so we're all gonna be part of this together. We all have a role together. So that happens in, 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 in the daily thing. So we don't turn it into an academic thing. Today, you're going to learn this. No, it's, it's, it's an organic thing, you know, that you're doing with the family. Uh, but but being in, but teaching them how to be in service to the family. So you know people talk about taking out trash and um, and chores. They, even the word chore it has a very negative connotation. I don't call them chores in my in my home. These are life skills. These are leadership development. This is character building. Uh, you know when 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 the when a child when a child spends some time getting down. You know uh, in uh, my parents are from India. So we have this unique way of uh, sweeping the floor. We get up, get down kind of um, in a squat position on the floor, very close to the ground, you know, and we are sweeping uh, in, into a little dustpan. So I never got one of those big, you know, uh, you know uh, dust bins where you stand, on, uh, stand up and you're pushing the dust in. I get down to the ground because I do believe that this actually, it, it actually is an exercise in humility. And, uh, and getting close to the dirt in the end, you know, we want our children to become hum be humble. And when they have this, this opportunity, cleaning the bathroom, cleaning the floor, these things are, are actually great that'll be opportunities in our homes. Um, Dr. Seema, did you want to continue maybe on with maybe starting with personal belongings? Yeah, there, there are just so many things that uh, <clears throat> I thought of while you were uh, speaking and students, you know, have their own personal belongings and that ownership thing. And when they're little, they learn about sharing, but somehow still we grow up with, you know, the possession and, and having things uh, that are ours. Uh, but the best things that are ours are our things that are in their place, <laughs> not all over <laughs> the place where everyone else is going to fall over them, trip on them, have to move them. Uh, and so I think teaching children at a young age that everything has a place and everything should be kept instead of in clutter in its place. So I think that's an important goal for us to think about. We have our learning space that we started with in the beginning, you know, that we set up a learning space and that we don't have our dishes there. We don't have our plates and our food there. We have that in the kitchen or at the dining table and then personal belongings in our room or on a bookshelf or you know, those are important skills. Um, 
Handyman, handy woman skills. I guess they're kind of like the same. I can change a light bulb, but I can also put a new light switch if I need to. I keep it a secret because I want someone else to do it. But, you know, as we grow up, you know, in, in high school, one of the things that everybody learns is they learn driving, right? And they, they learn at a certain age, they're going to get their driver's license. And in driver's ed, they teach you how to change a tire. You know, men and women, I've always said that that skill that we both learn in order to drive a car, we should look at Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did many things in the home that some people today would say was women's skills. So whatever you can do in your home to help children learn how to do, you know, a measurement for where a picture should be hung or, you know, uh, thinking about... Uh, keeping track of, you know, changing a carpet and understanding some of the things that, you know, an installer might do. I used to use um, perimeter and area in sixth grade and send kids home to measure whatever yard they had, whether it was an apartment building or their own home. They should be able to measure the perimeter of that space for a fence. And then in their room, they should be able to measure the area for a carpet. And many students have told me in the past that that, you know, introduction in terms of what we need to know at home to take care of our home, integrating math into it was a very valuable life skill. So we've mentioned cooking and we've mentioned cleaning and dishes and, you know, any other skills that we can think of in this gathering. Um, we should share them and think about them and think of them as part of um, the homeschooling and the family, um, you know, plan and circumstance and curriculum. Uh, sharing space is going to be a big challenge in these times. I've talked to a couple of my sons who have their kids at home. And he said, I don't know whether this is my computer anymore. This is my business, my personal computer. And now my kids are using it for school. And they have three kids. So mashallah you know, they need to be online at a certain time. So we need to work out ways so that we're not, um, you know, uh, unable to share, um, sharing devices, sharing desktops, you know, sharing, you know, the furniture that we have in our home so that everyone can work from home. We have parents, mother, father working from home and two or three kids working on schoolwork from, from home. So it will be a lifelong skill and it really works for the next uh, topic as well, I think. Is it journaling? Play in downtime. Is that yours? Brother you can Frank? go ahead and start. Why don't you go ahead and start? You know, the next so one. It's important that we have pleasure. And I think we see that in, in the Sia. We know that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, enjoyed um, downtime and engaged in fun. Um, and, and so this is important. And, and these four items that we put here, journaling, exercise and physical fitness, unstructured play and makerspace all relate to being in our homes now, whether it's homeschooling that we're gonna continue or whether, and we have been doing homeschooling, I did it for a number of years, um, or whether it's just for this period of time, we wanna be successful and happy families at the end of this either way. I suggest everybody keep a journal. I keep a journal and I've been keeping a journal for 30 years and I have lots of little journals that I've kept for different reasons to help me think. But I put on here that uh, drawing for certain ages would be perfect. Drawing the feelings that they have. Feelings are very important at this time. Um, a photo journal, taking some pictures, even taking pictures of some headlines because they're hearing things about the coronavirus and about your state's ruling, um, you know, what, what your governor has done, what the president has done, or then finally the written journal. Uh, but the way they're using computers, it could be a journal with some links. So they could write an essay and then throw in a link to the news from that day and, and, and look at numbers maybe in some areas, some things they would like to keep track of. I think the exercise and physical fitness I know uh, can be done online. I have a former student teacher um, who's doing an activity every day uh, on Facebook, face, 
you know, live Facebook. And I notice him every day and he's just laughing and talking and hoping that his kids are exercising, walking up and down the driveway, bouncing a basketball, um, you know, which brings us to unstructured play that, that students really need to be able to. And I remember saying this to my children over the years, much before I thought about what we're dealing with and doing now. You need to be able to play one on one. You need to go and occupy yourself and be busy with something. A lot of times, Legos and other activities, other than our screens, unstructured play. One of my uh, grandkids, their family has made a bunch of cards and they've been addressing cards. So they've got the address, city, state, zip, you know, stamp to worry about return address, and they created the Ramadan Mubarak card for many people. So, you know, that in a sense for them, drawing the pictures and coloring was play. And then the wisdom of the family to turn it into a project. Uh, and then finally, uh, Makerspace. Um, I have a favorite book, it's called Launch. I don't know if you can get a glimpse of it there. A lot of times it doesn't show through. Launch, uh, it stands for something, the L-A-U-N-C-H. Um, home is a lot like a makerspace. And schools are trying to create makerspaces in place of libraries so that children learn the highest level of, you know, brain power, let's call it, uh, create. You know, they can create a video, create an infographic on a lesson they've learned. Or, you know, last year, I, I also am a principal of a Sunday school. It's my 20 some year, I don't know. And uh, last year I had students, um, you know, create an infographic about a surah. So you could create a poster in, you know, handwritten poster. You could grow plants. I did a video last week for my Sunday school about growing plants. We cut the bottom off of celery and the bottom off of cabbage. And we put it in water and we have cabbage sprouting and we have uh, celery sprouting. Then we put it in dirt. I grow off alpha sprouts in my home. So we understand the germination of seeds. And we think about the ayah in the Quran where it talks about not a leaf falls, also not a seed grows or sprouts, but that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills it. So if we incorporate makerspace and Islamic knowledge and ayahs of the Quran, we will make the entire environment within our home, the playtime, the downtime, the family time, into a curriculum that's rich, rich, rich with exactly what we're looking for. Ah, we don't hear you. Zakalah Khair and inshallah. This is, I think, the last slide from the tip side, and then we can move on to the other part of the discussion. And so basically, uh, uh, there's one more slide, sorry. So this just is uh, the importance of connection. And I know that uh, you know this is happening a lot more, but we just want to make sure we're intentional about it. Uh, the opportunity to really uh, be with our kids. Um, my father-in-law, he, he uh, when I was very you know young and as a newly uh, married uh, person. He coined this term "just us time," and uh, ever since then, I've, I've been a big proponent of it. Uh, it, it, it actually it added a tremendous amount of, of, of quality to my marriage and then to my my family time. And what that was is that, in early on, uh, he would advise us to basically turn off, like de disconnect, you know, um, at a certain time of the day. For example, we had a, a two-hour block set that no matter what, during this time, no one's going to answer any call. No one's going to get on a new screen. This is just us time. Now that evolves as your children grow, uh, but but the beauty of that is again, it's it's this is like no interruptions whatsoever for our family during this time. It's quality one on one. It could be one on one with children, so it doesn't have to be long, but it could be a few minutes. You know, there's a lot of research about that. You know, how much time to to connect individually with children. So spending some time with young one, spending one time with older one, and it looks different, of course, by age. What that what kind of quality. Uh, time look what that quality looks like but it's about connecting so we want to make sure we use this uh, time that our kids are home to to get to know them to understand their strengths understand their weaknesses particularly being paying attention to their socio-emotional self 
Uh, I can't emphasize enough the, uh, how many parents, again, focus so much on the academic and we, we have that piece, it's important. Uh, but in life, if we look at our lives as adults now, how much of the quality of life that we have is, is, is um, directly tied to something we yeah, studied in school? I'm sorry? Yeah, you, you, you frozen for maybe 30 seconds. So we missed what you said. Okay, I'm sorry. I think I, I left off at, uh, did I leave off at getting to know your children's strengths and weaknesses? Did you hear that part? You, you start talking about giving every kid based on their age specific time. Okay, uh, then I was mentioning that basically this is an opportunity to really get to know the strengths and weaknesses and the personalities of our children, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, usually the, the reality is we're, so, we're always so busy, whether it's busy in, in work or we're busy at, in activities with the masjid, we're busy with uh, you know, even our own uh, relatives or social, uh, they're often, we often miss opportunities to really get to know our children. And, and the key is to do that when, when, as they're young and, and to form, form, that, form that bond. You know, they, uh, we, we call it, um, um, uh, uh, it'll come back to me, but basically your, your gaining hearts, yes. Gainhearts.com, it's a website. We call it gainhearts.com. It starts from the young age. And as you spend time with your children and you get to know them, when, they have, when there's a strength, you're praising them, you're appreciating them. Uh, there's a lot of hugs and, and words of affirmation involved. Uh, this is a great opportunity to, to hug, you know, physically connect. Uh, you know, the doctors here can talk about uh, oxytocin and, and all the other things that are um, released in the, in the body when we have this kind of physical contact. Uh, but the, the, there, this is uh, this opportunity to have that physical connection, that, that positive physical connection with our children is, is unlike any other we've, we've, we've been given. So uh, just getting to know them, the, their personalities. When it comes to the, the uh, socio-emotional uh, health, I really wanna emphasize that part and, and because sometimes, again, we're looking at, we, when we ask our kids about uh, what's important, uh, it, it's grades, how are they doing with their grades in, in school, which is again, important. But the big piece that we want to focus on is how, what are their emotions like? How do they express those emotions? How do they deal with their emotions? Mm -hmm. If we look at ourselves as adults, how much of the quality of life we have is either improved or worsened by how we manage our emotions? Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at it, <laughs> the majority of families' challenges come from emotional reactivity that, you know, there's anger or there's uh, there's lack of patience or there's uh, things that are said with, in, a, in a way without thinking before they speak. So uh, be paying attention to our children because all of our children have their own personalities. I have four. Each one is very unique and different. And uh, so being paying attention to what are those things that we need to help this child develop that self-control, this child particularly, to develop the ability to actually communicate. Maybe they, this child is not communicating uh, orally when they're really upset. So maybe, maybe they should have an alternative. They can write, they can send an email, they can ask uh, you know, for, uh, I mean, there are different ways we can do it, but providing opportunities for children to be able to express their emotions and communicate that. This is a great time to get to know how our kids do that, what are their strengths and, and weaknesses and how can we work on that? So that's just a, an a, a important piece there for getting connected. And the very last one, uh, Dr. Seema, did you wanna take this one, Ashal? Sure, the fact that we, we know that we have um, the opportunity to follow in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, gives us the opportunity to, um, to bring him into our home on a regular basis and discuss the things we know. I have the Sahih Muslim and uh, the other set, I'm forgetting the name, um, Hadith books and talking to kids about how Hadith is organized you know, and the two valuable aspects of how the collection was originally made is a good place to look at noble character, not just of the prophet, but of the people who knew him. And, and so there was a need to look at not only the memory of a person, but also the validity of the character of the person was looked at before the hadith was, you know, to become authentic and recorded by, by those who recorded it. And I think sharing that with children, uh, I do it in my Sunday school program where we actually you know, make pencils and mugs and we think about following the steps of, uh, footsteps of the prophet and following the sunnah. And so in our home, how can we do that? 
How do we eat? How do we drink? How do we speak? How do we interact? You know, and there's so much more. I, I think we're running out of time. But, you know, as parents, we have that opportunity to say to our kids, ah, I noticed some really good character traits. I noticed some character traits in you, like those that I've read about in our prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, so that they realize that you're tuned in to who they're becoming as people and that you're happy with that. So I, I missed saying earlier that as parents in homeschooling settings and as we look at our curriculum, this is a time to show, not tell. We show by our own noble character, by being a good example, by having our children meet with people who are good examples or showing them you know, recordings and videos and uh, live, uh, you know, lectures, but don't make them watch the whole thing, just, you know, parts of it. Um, getting that opportunity for them to understand the richness, the adab of the person giving a speech or a talk and, and eye contact and the, you know, the, um, you know, expressions in our, in our language, you know, whether we're perturbed with someone or we're pleased with someone. Even if we're perturbed, we don't have to show it. There were so many examples in the Sira where the lesson was not taught on the spot. It was saved for an opportunity because the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, taught, and he was sent as a teacher. He taught by an example and analogy, but sometimes he taught with different stress points on different people, different, you know, members of the community, we have to do that in our family. And we have to make it acceptable that I deal with you in different ways, because you're different people. And you may need my leniency tomorrow. <laughs> and, and he did have, mashallah, the prophet's example is pristine and, and excellent for us. He had many, you know, examples. And, um, so if we think about the modeling noble character, it's a work of art that we won't finish as long as we live. But we must work on it every minute we're living. So uh, this uh, first part was basically just about the the you know tips and challenge. Dr. Mohan, I wanted to just ask you uh, from the timing side, we were just going to have about maybe a 10 minutes uh, just to talk a little bit about uh, options, um, homeschooling options outside of um, or beyond COVID. Do we have time to do that now or? Uh, let's take a few questions about what you just said. So don't sure. get distracted. Um, Everyone is welcome to type the questions in the chat box or raise their hands. I can unmute you to ask the question. Uh, waiting for your questions, I have a couple of them that came to my mind while listening to your beautiful presentation. So uh, you spoke about um, building the, the skills and kids to be handy men, handy women, and to train them how to be responsible individuals. Um, is it too late to train a high schooler or middle schooler to build up these skills? No, of course not. Okay, so how can we do that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that they're just, I don't know. Um, I, I have this conversation all the time with Sunday school parents. Okay. You know, Sunday school parents who come in to me and say, I'm so frustrated. How did you raise your kids? I know you have several. What did you do? You know, and, and maybe I did some of it from the beginning, but hey, parents learn as we go. We didn't get the manual of raising Muslim children when they, you know, were born and we gave them a Muslim name. So, you know, we have the job of figuring out how that fits as we grow and develop our children. So I think, you know, I usually say to them, the first step is sitting down and talking with your, with your students, your children, your teenagers, you know. And, and I've lived long enough to say that I had these, you know, wild little children at one time in my life who grew up to be wild little middle schoolers and then ones who talk back and, you know, and all these things, but alhamdulillah, you know, calling them to prayer and waiting for them to come and not starting until they get in the line 
pays off in the long run later because you'll see them with their children, if you can live that long, you'll see them bringing their children to the prayer line and one of their children giving the azana. You'll see your parenting, you know, spelled out in their parenting. So sitting down is step one, you know, to have a conversation. Step two is to listen, be good listeners, you know. You, what is it that makes you not, you know, as courteous or polite uh, when you respond to me? Like, I want to rule out something from, you know, their language, like you can't say this to me. What is it that they say to you that annoys you? I will say to them, you can't say this to me. Okay, and, and you don't want me to say this to you? Okay, I won't say this to you. So I'll stop saying, hurry up, hurry up. What's taking you so long? If you <laughs> stop saying, what, what, what? Why do you make me do that? And then I have an agreement. Oh, you forgot. I haven't been saying to you, hurry up, hurry up. But you just said to me, what? Why do I have to do this? So we make these little agreements and we say, you know, I want you to love me. But more than this, I want you to grow up so that your children will love you. Because being a parent is not easy. So you're not just interacting with me, you're becoming a person who's either going to be loved by their own children or what you feed out, dish out to me, that might be your children. So they need to see a logic. They need to think about, you know, why are my parents saying that to me? Not just that we say it and we demand it and we insist on it. Does that help, brother? I don't know if that's what you Yeah, doing. that's beautiful. And actually, I want you to rephrase the statement about prayer because I think many parents struggle with, hey, come on, let's pray. Okay, just a second. Almost there. Yeah. And then we have to wait for a few minutes and then just go ahead and pray without them. Um, yeah, we make a habit not to go without those who are trying to get the wudu, but they haven't made it there yet. And they're not going to make it to the prayer line. Well, if you wait and people realize that you are going to wait for them, and then they come to the line late and everybody's been waiting for them, they feel it. Mm. So that's what I mean by show, not tell. Okay. You know, um, and there will be times when you maybe you can't wait for them and maybe they you realize that that's not appropriate. But, you know, what I said about, you know, this consistent perseverance that we need in our homes and our households, paying off later when you see your children raising their children much the way you did, you know, if you don't use your hand and you don't use bad language and you don't use a bad tone, there are just so many things that get, you know, eliminated. This is not going to happen. I'm not, you know, I remember as a, you know, an Islamic school principal, full-time school, having to take a father away from his son and say, you can't do that here. You know, you can't be upset to that degree here. We want to talk in a good way, in a polite way, you know, and, and I told him you can't. And he didn't like it, partly maybe because I'm a woman telling a man something, but I, I was the principal. Yeah. And, and so I think it's a development in your own mind that I'm going to be patient like the prophet. Peace and blessings be upon him. I have to embody that kind of patience and that sincere love. And I have to be willing to wait. Just look at the stories we have of him waiting, of him, you know, conserving his own emotion. And he, you know, even the man who urinated in the carpet, or probably not the carpet, in the mosque. Um, but, you know, waiting and letting him finish that's big I mean, that's huge. So as parents, we can wait on the things that are happening with our children. And I think after one day, two days, three days, you'll see that, you know, the young people will, um, you know, begin to consider it in a different way. Exactly. I hope that's helpful. Brothers, I hear you probably have a lot to add. No, Zakhalak. I, I, the only thing I would just add, and from my side, is just that um, that that whole idea that you know, generally teens don't like to be told to do something on the spot. Uh, mm -hmm. That's just the na natural nature of like you know. Yeah. So 
anything that can be done in advance. So the, the whole idea of advanced warning, I think that's the beauty of the Adhan. I, I, love, the, I love the whole concept of Adhan. I feel like it's just yeah. aligned with our human nature. It's not like you go right away. Adhan is given. So that's like your war, your first warning, right? To, mm -hmm. to go and make wudu and do all that stuff. And then you get time to go and actually prepare. So the same thing, like, you know, if, if my child is on a device or on the screen or doing something that they think is very important, that's great. So then they, you know, we give them uh, lead time, like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in 10 minutes. And then there's some, maybe, an, it, you know, every child needs a different number of alarms. If, you, just like getting up in the morning, you have a certain number of snoozes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it basically leads to less altercation if you ask them to do something on the spot versus if you give them lead time. And, uh, you know, uh, if my son is, is 30 minutes are coming up. He, my, one of my, my youngest child, if he gets 30 minutes of earned screen time, for example, he has to earn the screen time, you know, and uh, that earned screen time is coming close to the end. I will not just take it away. I start five minutes to seven minutes before and I say, hey, I, it's my in seven more minutes and come back three more minutes. So the, the emotional part of following the, the, the agreement that we had is much easier. I'm setting him up for success versus if I just grab it and then he's upset and all that stuff. So the same thing when asking them to do things like pray and, and do tasks and chores. The other part is the mindset. Like we talked, Dr. Seem talked about that, that conversation you're having. So it's like, you know, we're building leaders. You, you're, you are the next man of the house. You're, you are the, like my youngest, uh, you know, oh, feels so empowered when he gets to do stuff. Yeah. So the more things he gets to do, he now he feels like he's more and more of a, a man. And I have to, of course, remind him, you're only nine years old, but uh, you can't drive yet. But, you know, he wants to drive. And so, um, but the idea, but that mindset of, you know, we're all, we're all doing our part, you know, and this is all part of our part. And this is our leadership development. You're going to be a leader. And it's, it's a very positive mindset. So people feel, so for example, the leadership of calling people to prayer, you know, this is your week. You know, my, my the, the older child in this week, it's their week to go around and after the Adhan to remind everybody. Uh, maybe the, the next week it's the younger child's job, but giving them some kind of leadership role in it, it is, it, it, it's a self-policing kind of system. Like I'm, I'm responsible for that. So I don't even wait for my dad to come and tell me because I'm responsible to go do that job. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Speaking about prayers really quick, um, Almost always when I try to make a dedicated time for hadith or ayah or reflection after a prayer, uh, I, I, I have to commit it is not structured. So just come to my mind while I'm praying, okay, after, after the prayer, I will let the kids sit and we discuss. If I try that, no, no, we are busy and it's not a good time. So should we structure that and plan it ahead of time so everyone is aware that this time is dedicated for this reflection? Yeah, why not? Yeah. yeah. Especially with the team. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And, and even saying that, you know, no screens, you know, you think, okay, what time are we going to pray as a family, either Zohar or Maghreb or which one? So mm -hmm. put the screen time off, you know, a half an hour before that. So that, you know, yeah, I mean, you have to figure it out what will work for you, but plan a way so that you're not competing prayer against screen time. Yep. You know, like I used to talk about the comparison of, you know, our holidays and the other holidays. If we don't give the importance of our holidays, really make them, you know, fun and rich, then the other holiday looks more attractive. Yep. So if I can't use my screen now, then praying becomes not a competition with my screen. And, and so that may just help you a little bit, you know as you make that schedule from the first slide or two, I think it will help you um, to achieve your overall goal. And, and here's the thing, you know, if like I tell teachers in classrooms, if you make a bunch of rules and you don't use them, then don't be surprised when nothing is going the way you planned. So it's not about a bunch of rules. It's, you know, in classrooms, we say, you know, it's respect and rights and responsibility. That's good for home too. You may want to use the Arabic words. However, if you make a bunch of, you know, don't do this at this time, don't do that at that time, it will be um, a rigid and uneasy scenario for each day. And you'll play out kind of a misery every single day because there's too much, yep. you know, less is more. We, we know that we're not going 
to have, you know, uh, prayer and competition with screens because we've, we've discussed that. Yeah. We've agreed on that. And giving, you know, kids are brighter than we are. They are so smart. Alhamdulillah. They are so wise and they see us and they know, oh, you're telling me do as I say, but do as I do, you're, you know, and so they won't say to us, you're a bad example, but if we are, they will know. Amen. So trying to embody what we're trying to teach, though it's challenging, is really an important key. Exactly. I have a question here about managing a classroom with multiple students. I think it's also applicable for a home with multiple kids who are um, requiring multiple attentions and uh, you know focusing. What is your tips for those who have multiple kids who are stuck in a single home classroom? Brothers, here you want it, or you want me to keep going? Uh, I can maybe share one or two things, and you can share. But if you'd like to go first, you're fine, Shalom. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, obviously, almost all of us now are in that situation that we have multiple children. So if we can afford the space, that's why uh, I started off in the beginning with having a designated space that's quite distraction free. Um, it, it's definitely really, really important that every child feels that they have a space. It's it's critical to have a space. And um, one of the things that, you know, in the past, we might have really looked down upon, but now it some sometimes it creates that space is that um, getting the a headset, uh, which allows them to feel, yeah, allows them to feel a little bit like the headphone set that they have some set a sense of, of like personal space in, in, a, in a busy household. But we, in our home, we try to, you know, everyone has their own desk. Even my nine-year-old has his own desk. And, and so this is, uh, this is one. The second one that there's going to be a, a, that's part of the, the conversation is, is, uh, is how we use this shared space. So if we can afford to have different locations, that's awesome. And, um, if, and if we can't, then we have to have this conversation about how we create uh, some sense of, of shared space or some sense of personal space. The second thing I would just also mention is the, um, the divine and conquer um, uh, uh, role. It's, it's really, really critical that as we have multiple children who are needing support that now it's like all hands on deck. Um, and some families, like you know, it's 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 mom who think, who's taking all of this responsibility. But those times are old; they're so old. It's so obsolete that idea uh, that it's mom's job. No, this is if any time, <laughs> it's now that both parents need to get down and divide and conquer uh, as far as supporting the children. Dr. Seema. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I really like the idea of, you know, dads going on field trips in the real schools, you know, the person to person schools. So having dads helping at, at the desk of the nine year old or the 13 year old is, is going to really, you know, demonstrate the show, not tell, that everybody's learning, everybody's reading. I mean, I like to take my book into the living room when my grandkids are coming over and have a book that I'm reading before they come. And then they like to look at the book. So, you know, I think it's important to have, you know, uh, and, and they borrow books, they check out books from my bookshelves and we write down when they'll return them. So, mm -hmm. and then I can say to them, where's my book or, you know, and they bring them early because they want to get more, but it's, it's about relationships. So you have a relationship with three kids. It's going to be three different relationships. They have different, that's how you work with three different kids. Now, if there's a topic that comes, you know, that you can put at one time slot, if it's memorization, for example, of Quran, and you're memorizing and they're memorizing and you can use time that way, that's good. Well, why not do that with um, geometry? If math is the mathematics has the geometry section, maybe you look at the children's work and you see some overlaps where you can, you know, uh, overlap and use time wisely. Integrated teaching or integration of curriculum saves teachers a lot of time. Exactly. If you're talking about parts of speech, if everybody has something they have to write in one of their assignments, why not do some writing time together? That's what we said about the journal, a photo journal, a drawing journal, a writing journal could be instead of just a journal that it's a writing time 
So memorization time, writing time, and they don't have to be long periods of time, but then you can speak to them a little bit about, you know, good writing skills, good memorization skills. What strategy do you use for? And, and then, you know, there's just a period of time that you have to focus one-on-one. -on -one. And, exactly. you know, 10 minutes for each one, one after the other. Yep. It's worth it. Exactly. It's better to build strong children than to rebuild men. Hmm. I forget who said it, but uh, the better you do now. Exactly. Uh, For the sake of time, uh, can we go ahead quickly about the second part of the presentation, your experience and legacy? Sure, and so we'll yeah. make that we'll we'll cut this we'll make this kind of just short. To, and if anyone would like to stay and ask questions afterwards, you can. I know that they. Uh, I, I just checked on the survey. We have a few responses and some questions there that would I would we would like to address as well. So I think that would be really um, great. I'm, I thank you for filling out that survey because that helps us with some of the questions. I, I see there are about six responses now. Alhamdulillah. Okay, so just to kind of just quickly share moving forward here. Um, Uh, most of our families at this time are are, are kind of uh, put into a situation of, of homeschooling because of COVID. Uh, the question someone might be thinking now um, is, would anyone consider homeschooling beyond COVID? And Dr. Mohanad in the beginning talked about some of the reasons why uh, someone might uh, be concerned, especially in the middle school age, where children are developing their sense of identity and often where they have their identity crises where they're developing their morality and their sense of ethics and sense of uh, their worldview. Uh, why would they, why, so this is a time where uh, some families have considered, you know, maybe having more control on the variables in the environment. And uh, so one, uh, there are many options out there uh, for homeschooling. And uh, right now, I think in, in Dr. Mohanad in Missouri, are most of the kids doing remote learning in, in, with their schools at this time? So that's interesting experience. So our public school system started to try to do uh, like online uh, virtual schooling after the spring break. The experience was so terrible. They canceled all the communication and send kids with mailed packets or emails for assignments and just to give the parents a chance to uh, to go over the topics. Except our staff still handle they do a great job. I think uh, I, we have a blah, blah, blah. Uh, here with us, you may uh, comment about your experience. Uh, then, but yeah, I think that school is one of the very few schools that remain in virtual daily uh, live chat with, with the kids. Otherwise, everyone in the public just get the assignment to their parents. Great, alhamdulillah. So you're you're then you're you're familiar at least with the, the idea that there is obviously multiple types of you know uh, schooling, and you see the 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 challenge of not really having a face-to-face -face interaction. So that's one thing that we, you know, we, we, what we started doing with, uh, and I'll just tell, share this quick story. Uh, my children, uh, you know, my wife and I, uh, who were, we were born and raised here in the U.S., we, uh, we, we really were not really satisfied with uh, any of the schooling experiences we had with our children from a young age. And we tried, like I said, uh, we're in the middle of Oklahoma. Uh, we tried, you know, public school. Uh, there was an Islamic school here. We tried that for some time. We, we've, we've done all of the different things and what we, we came to the conclusion that maybe uh, there's a possibility that we could find another model, an alternative model that would help us deal with this issue of uh, being able to help our children develop an Islamic worldview. Because in the end, it's that identity, that strong Islamic identity and the way that they see the world that helps them to navigate the challenges that they face when they enter high school and beyond in the real world. We have so many young Muslims now in America who are having crisis of faith, who are leaving Islam, who are, are having so many challenges. And so we look back at that as, you know, knowing, going through this system uh, ourselves, we wanted to, to, uh, to try to maybe offer an alternative. So that one of the, the things that we uh, looked to do was to say, okay, can we create a, a program that will address this age group specifically, but solve some of the problems that a lot of our other schools have, which is, um, trying to find out if we use the online model, we can bring together possibly the best talented Muslim teachers uh, from wherever they are, even in the world. And that's kind of what we started doing. We, and, and, and we can also develop a curriculum that will address some of the, uh, that will be infused of, with the Quran, infused with Islam so that when they study science, it's not going to be devoid of Allah. It's not going to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, giving all attributions in history to, 
white Europeans, for example. We, we look at the historical uh, contribution of uh, Muslims and uh, through, through to civilization and society, things like that. Uh, and so this is where we developed this, this uh, concept of you know, legacy international um, online high school. And what we did was we, we basically tried to find the, the, the most knowledgeable people uh, we could in the field of Islamic education. And, and we went all over the world. So we had people from Australia, like Dr. Nadim Maimon. You have Dr. Sima Imam, one of the f pioneers in Islamic education in America. Um, Dr. Susan Douglas, who is world renowned when in, in her knowledge of, of history. Dr. Noor Jannah, who is the uh, she is the center, uh, she's the director for the Center of Islamization at Islamic University of Malaysia, and, and so on and so on. So we basically, were, Allah guided us to an all-star team of, of, of thought leaders and experienced educators to come help us develop a program that we believe, uh, inshallah, will uh, be transformational. And we also got uh, some uh, other very uh, well-known uh, activists in the country to support our program. And in short, what I'll just basically say what makes this unique and different is that we have uh, worked really hard to use the, the, um, the, not, the, the not having the restriction of a, a specific geographic location to try to recruit the best talent that we can from wherever they are. So looking for people who have a master's degree in education, in education. So they went into education for that purpose and they're professionals and they have experience. And then on top of that, they have a strong Islamic uh, understanding based on the authentic Quran and the Sunnah which is not necessarily easy to find. I'll just give you one example. So one of our teachers, she, she had a master's degree in, in, in education, focused on math. And she also uh, studied for, she, for five years in the uh, Islamic seminary in the Qalam Institute with Sheikh Abdul Nasser. So when she teaches math, uh, all of her math word problems and, and uh, in, in, infuse Islamic concepts. And she, she has word problems about zakats and word problems about, you know, things that you wouldn't imagine that your kids in middle school are learning, uh, but it's all kind of or organically infused. And that's it in uh, our seventh grade uh, math teacher right now. Uh, so there are things like that that, that we uh, are special to the program. The other thing that uh, is unique uh, about the, uh, the program is, is that focus on the socio-emotional learning. We, we really, are, our, our vision is cultivating compassionate global leaders. So we're trying to, uh, really build this understanding that, that this faith is not just about reading Quran and praying. It's about becoming a rahma to the world like the Prophet ﷺ was. And what does that look like? And it takes it will take time to develop that, but that's something that's infused. And of course, the, the last piece is that uh, the, all of the courses are trying to reinforce the Islamic worldview and the Islamic identity. And uh, there's a lot of collaboration between the staff to make that happen. So uh, I just in a nutshell, that's kind of the overall... Um, um, idea. The other thing that's unique about the program is that uh, it's very uh, flexible that allows uh, families who may be public schooling or maybe uh, homeschooling or maybe going to going to Islamic school to take one, two or three courses with our program, even if they weren't going to be full time. And there's some who are doing it full time. The kids will benefit the most from the integration between all the subjects, are, of course, are, are the full time students. Um, but we do have some students who are taking just tafsir or Arabic uh, with a very, very uh, relevant, uh, you know, uh, uh, young graduate of the Islamic seminary. Uh, and we have a lot of leaders, like, like I said, like Dr. Altaf Hussain uh, and uh, uh, Sheikh Abdul Nas, uh, Dr. Kamal Hassan, who was one of the uh, teachers of uh, the one of our board members. And uh, he is the former rector of the Islamic University of Malaysia. And he was so uh, excited about the futuristic uh, model that was being proposed here especially with the emphasis on socio-emotional learning and Islamic infusion. Uh, and, and the last uh, person I have here, Sheikh Abdul Nasser, uh, who has uh, uh, known us for a very long time. And he uh, was very, very excited about this uh, program also being a solution for a lot of the uh, uh, secondary uh, uh, level children, especially the children of, of, of activists and scholars who have not been able to find resources for their children. Uh, so that's in a nutshell uh, about legacy, and I will stop here now. And uh, I don't know, Dr. Sima, if you want to say, say anything, but I we have like six uh, sets of questions here in the survey. So it's up to you, Dr. Mohanna. How would you like to proceed? I would like to go ahead with the questions, and you you distribute them between you and Dr. Sima because I cannot see these questions. Sure, inshallah. So the first question I have. Uh, and Dr. Singh, we can both work on this one. It's let's talk about the. It says anything you suggest that can be said to comfort kids of all ages to help them 
have more peace with all of the uncertainty of what is going on. Uh, so this, this was one of the things that was addressed in, uh, we actually had a, a seminar, we probably uh, make that public, uh, yeah. but uh, Brother Imam Herbert, uh, one of our teachers, uh, he spent some time you know, with uh, our students listening to their feelings and their concerns about COVID. And of course, there's lots of anxiety and lots of uncertainty. But I think one of the things that the, the, he walked them through, the, the process he walked them through was to help them refocus on what is the ultimate goal of, of uh, all of us. The ultimate goal is to please Allah and to go to Jannah. And uh, that sometimes when we look at trials and tribulations, uh, we, we, we see them uh, uh, for the things that they don't allow us to do. But there are actually many benefits of trials and tribulations. And one of them is that we can recognize, you know, the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, he talked about how, uh, you know, how many of you, uh, how many of us worry about getting sick or worry, have our parents worry about getting sick or their relatives getting sick? And then he asked them, do you ever worry about Allah getting sick? And uh, this was just to bring the point home that, you know, Allah is the one whom you worship and he, he will never get sick and he is the one who is the source of all cure. And when you go through this type of trial, you, can, you, you understand the greatness of Allah. And put that that gets in your heart, and then you should it, it can uh, help you understand that this is the one you're relying upon. He is the one you're relying upon. But the other part that he talked about was the whole idea that how do you get to Jannah? It's by doing good deeds and 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 losing or or uh, erasing bad deeds or avoiding bad deeds. Well, Subhanallah, the 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 ibtila or the difficulty every moment that one is patient during it. Uh, they have an opportunity to have their sins being, you know, erased. And you talked about the, if you, you're pricked from a thorn, even a prick of a thorn, you you have uh, expiation of sins. So this is a, a, an opportunity to do lots of good. It's also an opportunity to erase bad deeds, getting us closer and closer to uh, to the, the goal of, of uh, earning Allah's uh, reward of, of paradise. Uh, so that's just a, a, a thought process he walked them through uh, that was that seemed to be very effective with a lot of middle school aged kids. Dr. Seema, did you want to mention anything? Here? Yeah, the one thing that I think is important, and I and that's a very good answer, and I know the presentation was good uh, that day for our students, is listening. I think we have to have you know not that we bottle it up. You know, even sharing that you know all of us have a certain amount of fear, and we turn to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and. In the time of the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, the thunder would make him go to the mosque. So if we're fearful of the life that we're you know, experiencing now, we can go to our prayer rug and go to our Quran and, and feel the peace that we get. Um, we don't have to have answers. We could say, why is the sky blue? But we won't get the answer to that. So why is this happening? I think Brother Zahir has uh, given us that, but I think it's the relationship and the openness. Uh, Brother Zahir, for the sake of time, would you mind just like you pick up a question and Christina will pick up another. So just okay. keep one, two minutes per each and uh, let's get it done, inshallah. Sure, sounds good. Okay, inshallah. The next uh, question I have here uh, is, Uh, what suggestions do you have for helping uh, seniors? It looks, it sounds like seniors in high school who have an extra sense of loss, grief, uncertainty, since they will not be able to go back and make up the social part of the end of their year uh, and the experiences and programs they were involved in, uh, even academics preparing for college, um, formal celebrations uh, of their academic careers, uh, basically. So what suggestions do we have for seniors? Uh, since I have, uh, I teach a group of seniors as well, uh, since I also have a, a, a brick and mortar school here that I work with, uh, I can maybe share just a point here that is um, the, uh, it's not easy. There's no really easy way to, uh, to make up for what they're not going to quote unquote get and do. What we have done though in our side is we implemented this, this, uh, this whole idea of having regular social time so we actually have uh you know this just like we're doing right here zoom our we have uh, zoom time with our entire senior uh, class and they do everything from actually planning things uh, to actually to uh, uh even playing games uh so we have you know there's the games that they actually play it's hangout time online 
uh, it's not the same as in person, but it is uh, continuing those types of relationships. That's for the social part, uh, for, from the social part of it. From the academic part, I would have to say, I'll just share with you since I've, I've been, had a lot of experience in just not only uh, setting up and developing secondary programs and had so many uh, classes of 13 classes graduated um, under uh, w w uh, when I was principal of the school uh, there, that, that last semester is not going to uh, really affect their career per se in any major way. Whatever they've done over these years, uh, the habits that they developed and the knowledge that they've gained, that's going to carry on with them. This last quarter is not going to have a major quote unquote impact. And, and I think uh, most of the colleges and universities are actually uh, you know, very, very relaxed and, and flexible about whatever happened in this, in this particular year. It's going to be treated unlike anything else. So I, I think that, that part, the, the, the uh, worry and uncertainty about that part it, it, you know, can be alleviated by the fact that co the colleges are very, very understanding and no one will be looking at, you know, that's why most of the schools have done pass fail and not even using grades for seniors. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's all I for that. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. Recommend it. All right, the next question here. Uh, Dealing with, uh, how do we deal with kids taking too much time on electronics and the screen? <laughs> All right, Dr. Sima. So, you know, some families completely, you know, wanted in the past to eliminate this from their household and they did not allow screens to be a part of their family's lives. And now we have screens being used as the main, you know, schooling device. And it's been a, a very difficult challenge uh, for them. But there were families who had given so much leeway that they could not compete with the child who was always on their screen. So it's like anything else. Parents have to be parents and parents have to make limits. And the conversation about limits can, can relate to chocolate, it can relate to anything. Look kids, if I was doing something harmful, I'm your mom, I'm your dad, if I was doing something harmful, would you want me to stop? Would you tell me to stop? Would you help me stop? And would you expect me to stop? What if I play with matches every day and I burn just a little bit more? of the sofa just a little bit more just a bigger fire than i did yesterday and just a bigger fire than i did the day before and then you realize that mom could burn the house down that's the same kind of thinking of your mind is being consumed by your screen you start to think like the game, you act like the game, you walk like the game. It doesn't mean that every time everybody's on a screen, they're on a game, but I'm suspecting that those who are most challenged are challenged because kids are you know, surfing incessantly, shopping too much or playing the same game over and over and over again. And some of the games that kids play are really, uh, they, they are about killing, you know, they are about killing yep. and more and more and more. And so this is an example of how it affects your mind, you know, and how you have to control, self-control, self-discipline. If everybody has self-discipline, no one has to apply discipline. So if kids could begin to discipline themselves and set themselves up with two or three less hours than yesterday and get themselves in control, parents could, could live with that. But I think we have to have a serious talk with the one who's always and give some tough examples because it's detrimental to overdo, you know, the screen. It's, it needs, ev like everything else, to be in balance. And parents need to help get it into balance. Is that okay? 
So, Dr. Manan, I know it's uh, now 11.38. I don't know if, uh, should we address more or maybe those who want to stay on, we can address them or however you'd like to proceed. I, I have a, uh, the, the questions box are, or I think we answered them. There were a few other comments that were made in the, the biggest challenges that are being faced that they're looking for maybe some advice on. So we, we can continue or it's up to you. So pick up the, the, the most important two questions, I'll say our comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. so. we have to sacrifice at some point, you know. Yeah, yeah. and we'll we'll you'll have, you know we can give our email address afterwards if anyone would like to ask any specific sure. questions. We'd be happy to, inshallah, address them afterwards. Uh, I, I think one of the questions that may raise to everyone here. So legacy now is in its first year of academic performance. Uh, what are the school grades that you are currently recruiting, and are you planning to expand next year? Uh, so basically, the um, so Legacy is currently um, offering grades six to nine. And, and however, we're opening the door for five through 10 uh, just because we've had some inquiries, but it will be based on an enrollment. So if we have a minimum of, of 10 students in grades five or grade 10, we will open those subjects, uh, assuming that we have the, the, the faculty for it. So, but uh, six to nine is our, our span and five to 10 is our expanded expansion uh, project um, that we're thinking about. Uh, and so, yeah, and so the, uh, yeah, this was the first year we, we did offer six, seven, and eight, and we also offered courses for a ninth grader this year. While we are picking a question, I would like to uh, invite uh, our IC, uh, Islamic school uh, administration. I think uh, Abla Wafa is on the line. Um, can she comment about the school experience and say something about uh, our transition during this time? I'm trying to unmute. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Yeah. Actually, it's not Abla Wafa. This is Abla Fatuma. Oh, welcome. Welcome, Abla Fatuma. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, you can go ahead and... Okay. Those here can go ahead. Oh, is that like Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, let's see here. The other two topics. Um, hmm. This is what this was related to, to the other question. Is a, a second point about young children, exposing children to electronics at a young age. Uh, okay. I can just, I think that's a question that a lot of people have had. So I'll just mention maybe two points about that. Generally speaking, you know, so if, there, if the child is under the age of, of 10 years old, you know, you, you don't want to put a, a, com a computer in front of them for, or give them more than two hours or so of screen time. Yeah. Uh, some, some might say you stretch it to three, but the uh, Dr. Muhammad Salim, who's one of the uh, educational technology uh, 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 doctor, he did doctorate in education technology. He put out a video sharing the developmentally appropriate amount of screen time for young young children. And so it, it is definitely a, a challenge um, to make that work because you want to get the instructional time in uh, if they are doing remote learning. Um, but uh, you, we have to balance it with everything else. So it's important to provide uh, alternatives uh, for, for kids and that requires time. So. Uh, you know, I remember when we first started the, the electronic uh, situation with an iPad and my youngest child was uh, becoming increasingly uh, dependent and excited about it. So what we did was we got chickens. <laughs> we got five chickens and put them in the backyard and we started raising them and, and it, 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 the attention was completely diverted to these chickens. Uh, and and it, it, it's a regular part of our day and, and time to spend time outside with these chickens. The next step was as growing up, getting a basketball hoop, uh, getting puzzles, trying to find ways to have alternatives. And of course we set those limits that uh, young children, is, it, it, school time, school work time is, is one thing. And then recreational time is something else. And in our, in our house, it's, it's something earned. You know, you can, make, you can make every chore, put it on a popsicle stick and put 15 minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever. And every chore that they do, uh, they're earning a screen time but maybe it's only on weekends, maybe it's only some days of the week. So, uh, but definitely setting limits on the screen time is really, really important for young age. Uh, the doctors uh, can talk about the uh, American Association of Pediatrics and what research they've found on young children, especially under two, who are in the effects of having screen time on their uh, um, attention span and other things when they get older. So we have to definitely manage that. Yeah. All right. Um, While you're reading the second question, uh, just quick announcement. Uh, Norton Antivirus have um, make the parental control uh, tool free for six months. 
So instead of like free 30 days trial, we are able to use the parental control tool for a whole six months, which allows you to control the time for each kid, uh, how many times the screen they can, what type of uh, websites and apps that they can use. And you can set up schedule. They, the, the device will turn off after this time. So uh, you can just go to the Norton parental control section. And from medical science point, as I'm an ophthalmologist, uh, you know, the eye gets strained with focusing for a long time on the screen and the eye stopped blinking naturally. So that uh, will, will exacerbate and worsen the symptoms of dry eyes. So uh, we may find kids trying to rub their eyes and try to blink and with maybe sometimes like with red eyes. So we recommend uh, the rule of 20, 20, 20. So every 20 minutes, take a 20 seconds break and try to look at 20 feet far away. That will relax the inner muscles of the eye, the accommodation muscles, and that will re relax the, you know, the eyes from straining. One more question and we're going to conclude, inshallah. Zakallah khair and Dr. Mohanad for sharing that. Okay, uh, so, I mean, this is just, a, I, I think, a general question about uh, balancing, balancing work and keeping children engaged during uh, the day. Dr. Seema, did you want to address that one? You know, I guess I'm a list maker, so uh, things that need to be accomplished, it goes back to those goals. You know, what tasks need to be accomplished will help us balance how much we can plan to do at the beginning of the day. So when we know what we wanted to do, then we come back and check it off. And, and maybe that helps us balance. How much time are we going to spend, you know, doing those home chores or, or cooking something, um, you know, if we allocate some times, then we'll, we'll find balance and we'll get into a different routine and a, a different habit. I like the book, um, Productive Muslim. Um, and, and it has a really good uh, poster. And the poster actually shares what was the habit of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. What was his daily schedule? So it's part of our, you know, uh, important Islamic teaching to have you know, allocated times and schedules. Perfect. Um, I, on behalf of the Muslim community, I think we uh, enjoyed a lot this session. Um, for the sake of time, we, I think we have to terminate now. It has been almost close to two hours now. So for your time and effort and bringing this um, highly professional experience to our community. Uh, I hope everyone attended today benefits from uh, this discussion. If people want to contact Legacy, can you just show us your contact info, your website? Sure. Uh, if you consider like uh, future schooling for their kids. Yes, and if anyone who has children in the secondary age group, uh, you're welcome to what we call shadow a class. So you can have your child to come and sit in on a class. Uh, the, the child is the one who is uh, getting a chance to experience it so they can sit in for a class and you just basically, um, you can email us. Uh, we have a contact us uh, information down here at the bottom of the page. Uh -huh. uh, you, it's uh, office at legacyiohs.org is the email address. Office, at, like, I'll type it over here. Office at uh, legacyiohs.org. And you can find out more information uh, by contacting us. Also, if you have other questions just related to homeschooling, um, Dr. Seaman, I would be happy to uh, address them outside of uh, this exactly. Can you also put the video about the brother you said who spoke about the screen time and? Oh yeah, Dr. Salim, sure. I can, I can get that for you, inshallah. Yeah, while you're doing that, I just want to remind our uh, participants here that today, inshallah, at 9 p.m. we have Dr. Ahmed Mrewid about a uh, session about Islamic history. And uh, on Sunday morning, uh, we have uh, Imam Musbahu, the Quran recitation at 10 a.m tomorrow morning. And on Tuesday, we have uh, the workshop about the will between Islamic and le legal perspective, uh, moderated by Dr. Shakir and attorney uh, Jason Simmons. They will talk about the will and planning for uh, death and after death uh, from the legal and Sharia perspective, inshallah. Uh, Dr. Simema, I'm so glad that you joined us today. I thank you for your time. I'm looking for the brothers here to put the link for the video um, in the chat box as well. And I will Happy share it with the community, inshallah, with our WhatsApp groups and the email list, inshallah. Jazakum uh, khair, everyone. Um,
we are done. Everyone want to leave, they feel free to do so. We're just waiting for the link to be posted. If you have to conclude, if you want to say something at the end, Dr. Sima Imam, feel free to do so. I just want to thank you for having us. I, I wish your community all the best and uh, do stay in touch. Sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Brother Zahir, any word at the end? Um, yeah, just pulling it up. It's uh, it's in an email, so in a different email, so I'm pulling it up now. That's fine. Is it published on YouTube or so? Uh, yeah, I believe it is on YouTube. I'm gonna, yeah, some considerations. Yeah, this is the one. Okay, I have it now. Okay. That's uh, the video right there. Perfect. Jazakallah khair. Wa for having us. Jazakallah khair and everybody. May Allah reward you all. And Jazakallah khair, Dr. Seema. Subhanakallah. Wa bihamdik wa shalamu na ilahi na tustakfir wa tubi laik. Awadu bin ahmad al-shaytan al-rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. rahim wal asr. Inna al-imusana lafi kusr. Inna al-ladhina amun wa aminu al-salihat. Wa tawasu bil-haq. Wa tawasu bil-sab. Jazakallah khair. Wa alaykum. 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 Wa alaykum.